From KLCC Media, this is the Oregon Grapevine. I'm Barbara Dellenbach. The Oregon Grapevine highlights fresh-pressed conversations with people who are actively and passionately creating the present and future in which they wish to live. Margie Boulay began her career on radio. She became a TV host and wrote for the Oregonian newspaper. She's been a stage performer and professional musician and joins me on the Oregon Grapevine. Thank you, Margie, for being here today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. This is one of my favorite subjects, theater. Let's start with radio, and eventually we'll get on to theater and just kind of where, <laughs> where we want to go with it. So I know you got your start in radio. How did, how did that happen? <laughs> Well, um, right out of college, I went to Whitman College. After that, I went to um, Italy and to uh, Austria in Salzburg at the Mozarteum because I wanted to be an opera singer. And then um, that was too peripatetic a life. So I wanted, I decided I wanted a, someday a house with a picket fence and children and a husband and all of that. So I moved back to Seattle and I got hired by King Broadcasting and I started as a secretary for the radio station. Um, and somehow I guess I was doing theater in Seattle and people at the station came to see me. So the guy who was the production manager who produced all the commercials and musical interludes and stuff like that, he had me come in and sing some jingles and which I had to write. It turns out I walked in the studio and I said, what do you want me to sing? And he said, well, I need you to make it up. (laughs) So I started uh, writing and recording commercial jingles. And then I started doing voiceovers for commercials, which led to voiceovers for other things. I went from singing uh, jingles for all kinds of things. I mean, at one point, I even sang a jingle for a singing role of Charmin toilet paper. (laughs) But um, I also started writing jingles, and I had my own little jingle company, and that led to doing voiceovers for commercials and narration for documentaries. And um, at the same time, I was uh, moving from King Radio which was a rock and roll station to King TV downstairs. Um, And this was all in Seattle. And I got a job as production assistant. And then next thing I knew, I was um, an associate producer for a live evening talk show. And then after that, I was doing news reporting. And I was, gosh, I did a little bit of everything, writing documentaries, writing scripts for a, a TV show called How Come?, and I would, you know, I, I was single. I was in my early 20s. I was having the time of my life. And I would go to work at 7 a.m. and I would stay till 11 p.m. Uh, if somebody was editing a, a, a documentary, I would go in and a wonderful man named Howard Hall and I'd say, how do you do that? And he taught me how to, how to edit film. And we were using film, not video back then. And, you know, actually taking the razor blade and, and cutting the film strips and putting them together. So I... It, it was play for pay for me. I was learning so much and having so much fun, enjoying the people who worked there, enjoying the work I was doing. I also filled in as the vacation replacement on the morning talk show called Seattle Today. And that's how I came to move to Portland. Actually, I had an incident of sexual harassment at the station, and my boss was sexually harassing me. At that point, I'm not even sure it was against the law to do that, but I knew I didn't want to work for him. And so I moved to Portland uh, as a, an associate producer and the host of AM Northwest with Jim Bosley. And I did that for 11 years and did other talk shows, too. It's, for a couple of years, I was hosting AM Northwest from 9 to 10 and the 2 at 4 show from 4 to 5 every weekday. So that was a, a busy time of life. At some point, you decided or someone decided for you or you got creative and and realized you also were a good and intelligent thinking writer and became a columnist. Well, all along, I'd been heading for print journalism. I really wanted to write. I I, I can't say this was the only reason, but as a child, I loved the Superman TV show because I wanted to be Lois Lane. She was the only woman I saw on TV who had exactly the same job as a man. She was a reporter. And so I edited my high school newspaper, and I uh, co-edited my college newspaper. But out of college, nobody wanted to hire me at, at a daily newspaper. That's why I took the broadcasting job. But I always had wanted to write. So 
um, our TV show was canceled because the station suddenly got rights to the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, and so, of course, they figured they would make more money on that show. And I was looking – I was offered a job in uh, in news at Channel 2, but I wanted to write. And so I heard that someone at the TV station had applied for a job uh, as a columnist at the Oregonian. And I thought, well, I'm going to apply for that. <laughs> And uh, I went in and I talked to the editor-in-chief, Bill Hilliard, and he said, what experience do you have writing? And I said, none, except for college, you know, in high school journalism. And, but I, but I, just, I just feel this is what I was meant to do. And so um, he said, well, you don't have any experience. It, it didn't look likely. So what I did was I offered to write four sample columns. I think I wrote them in a day or two. Uh, I was hired. That's awesome. And then you you proceeded to do that for a number of years. 23 yeah. years, mm -hmm. three columns a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you still this is we're not this is not linear, but do you still find yourself writing, obviously not for the Oregonian, but for other in other pieces of your life? It was it was obviously really important and something you wanted to do. How are you now writing? I'm in a writing group and um I I have continued to write in various forms. I've written several plays since the years that, um, since I left the Oregonian. And um, one of them was, I'm not sure what to call it, it, it and perhaps a nonfiction play. Um, it was based on true life stories of seven adult survivors of child sex abuse. And that's a subject and, and something I'm very interested in because my father was a victim of a Catholic priest from age four to 11. He was molested by a Catholic priest. Didn't tell us till he was in his 70s um, and told us at a Thanksgiving dinner. That was an interesting holiday. <laughs> wow. I was like, oh, dad, that's awful. Could you pass the turkey, please? <laughs> I mean, it was just, it, we were all shocked, but we saw him go through a lot of healing when he began talking about it. And it just became something of great interest to me. So I wrote that play. It was produced in Portland, in Seattle, in Los Angeles, and um, there was a production by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland. So that was nice. I'm also writing um, a memoir for my daughter. Um, it has been suggested that I publish collections of my columns, but <clears throat> I ran into some stumbling blocks with uh, the Oregonian giving me rights to my writing. So maybe someday, or maybe not. <laughs> I think that they served their purpose at the time when I wrote them. Let's move to theater, the world of theater, which I know has been something that has been, you've been in, you were in opera, you were a musical theater, it's, and you're doing a lot, of, a lot of things now. And I know theater can be seen as just, we're going to go be entertained and escape. It can be seen as kind of political movement. It can be seen as all of those. A lot of what you do is not really just for at all, for just entertainment, although certainly it's entertaining. If you would talk a little bit about your motivation and what you think of in your theater life. Well, first of all, I've been doing theater professionally since I was 16. I've done over 150 shows. And um, yes, at the beginning... I was really focused on musical entertainment. Um, and so I was involved in opera and musicals early on. My first professional production, when I got my equity card, I was 16 and I, I played Liesl in The Sound of Music in a theater in the LA area. I also did straight plays along the way once in a while. But the thing about theater, the theater community, is if you are someone who performs in musical theater, people who do straight plays, that is without music, no singing involved, um, they kind of consider you a lesser type of performer, I think. I, I, there are assumptions that opera singers are always really bad actors and musical uh, actors are, are just a little bit better. <laughs> but, but real actors are in straight place. So if you have a history of doing musical theater in, a, in an area, it's a little hard to be cast in straight plays. People just don't respect your work as much. Um, but what helped me was, first of all, aging, because there aren't very many roles in musicals for older women. Another thing that has helped me is, thank goodness, and I don't know why, but I seem to have retained a good memory. So I'm able to remember a lot of lines. And as 
as people age, we all experience some kind of memory problems, some more than others. And, and there are a number of actors who are not doing theater anymore for that reason. And so I'm, I'm, it may be that I, a lesser actor, am picking up roles that should have gone to better actors who can no longer um, easily remember lines. You know how that goes. <laughs> Maybe. I'll, I'll, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure about that, but I'll, you know, I'll accept it. <laughs> well, I've always done theater in the margins of my days. When I was a single mom with a teenager, I, I stopped performing for a number of years because I wanted to be there all the time for my daughter. Uh, then when she left for college, I started doing theater again. And now I'm, I'm, I'm keeping busy doing theater, and I'm loving it so much. But you talk about the reason theater is important. And yes, of course, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with providing entertainment and providing escapism. I think human beings are, are drawn to stories, and we are drawn to storytellers. I think we need stories. Um, and theater is a wonderful form of storytelling to bring people together, remind them that they are not alone, that there are others like them. But it, there are also other really, I think, perhaps more subtle reasons that theater is important. I, most actors I know, most good actors I know, actually feel the emotions they are expressing on the stage. They're really feeling that. I, I know I do. When I'm crying on stage, it's because... It's because I am living in the character and the character is in pain and I feel that pain just as much. And some nights, it's, it's interesting, I just went to a one-woman show about Eleanor Roosevelt. I actually played 15 characters, including FDR and Winston Churchill, if you can believe it. But that was an interesting voice to try to get. But as doing a one-woman show... Um, it's the same lines every night. The script is the same every night. But some nights, certain passages would move me to tears, and other nights they wouldn't. It's never the same experience. It's the same script, but it's never the same performance. I think it's good for audience members to share the emotion of the actor on the stage, of the character they're playing, um, I think it's also good to, sh to share the experience of taking that emotional ride with other audience members. I guess there are people in life who experience mo emotions that they, that they can't express. Maybe perhaps they were taught boys don't cry or things like that. Um, or perhaps they don't allow themselves to express in their own lives. And it allows them to vicariously perhaps experience those emotions. I, we've all had the experience of sitting, I think, of sitting in a movie theater, um, or I guess these days at home, but watching a movie and, and crying in the movie. When we're watching the, the character experience something we ourselves have experienced, but we didn't cry then. I think there's something about the theatrical experience, watching a theatrical performance, especially live in the theater, that gives you, you give yourself permission to experience those emotions. I mean, it's obvious that you can study societal pro pro problems by um, going to the theater, you can, by writing plays, by acting in them, that discuss problems that we're dealing with in our society. I think it helps you see the other side. <laughs> so, and also it sparks conversation. After, before, after you see a performance, especially if you go with someone, you want to talk about it. Whether you're critiquing the performance of the actors or whether you're talking about the issues or whether you're saying that character really blew it. You just want to talk about it. And by the way, if you're an actor, you really want to talk about it after a performance. And that's why doing a one-woman show can be really frustrating. <laughs> There's nobody to talk to. Hey, did you see the checkbook dropped on the floor? Did you see how I cleverly picked it up? <laughs> it's just, you know, you want to talk about it. You've talked about you know nonfiction and fiction, and obviously this piece you just did was was largely nonfiction, maybe all nonfiction. What about the stories of marginalized groups and the work you've done and the groups that are out there being involved with telling those stories and and sharing that with an audience? This is so important. I think, um, and it, I really enjoy all doing all forms of theater. I I I've done slapstick within the last few years at Lakewood Theater. 
I've done, um, I've done, you know, very serious drama. Um, those are fiction, of course. But the theater I really enjoy doing is when it's telling the stories of real people. Now, the show I just finished probably was 75% fact and 25% fiction. Maybe it was more like 50-50. I don't know. But we know the facts in the play were correct because we fact-checked them. And um, I'm not going to mention any playwrights, but you really need to do that because often they get carried away with their story and their facts are wrong. So that's important. But of course, the play I wrote myself was the true stories of seven adult survivors, as I said, of child sex abuse. That was an important story to tell because um, I made sure that almost half of the uh, cast was men. Men in particular just don't tell, or if they do, they wait a long time and, and they should tell sooner so they can get counseling and and be in a support group and understand they're not the only person who experienced this. They feel so much shame and guilt about it because it's just never expressed between men, especially. But they're, but that's true of women victims as well, just not in such great numbers. I also have, I did a play a number of years ago in Portland uh, based on the experiences of women who were some of the first women in the military. And I'm not talking nurses or secretaries. I'm I'm talking about actual uh, uh, people in uh, then non-combat positions, but still uh, doing military work. They it, when they began entering the military, and there these women were all about my age, and I'm in my early 70s now. This would would have been in the late 60s or probably the early 70s. There was so much resistance to them entering the military both from other uh, soldiers, but from those officers they they were working for and were commanded by. And their stories were compelling and fascinating. I had never read anything about what it was like for them. I think perhaps because they had that military mentality of, you know, what happens in the military stays in the military. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that was it. But uh, I did not write this play, but I, I acted in it, and I got to meet the woman I was playing, and we had so much in common, it was uncanny. For for starters, we were, I think, within like three weeks of each other in age, but we also agreed we, we looked alike, and um, it, it was really interesting, not only to meet her, hear her stories, try to become her on stage and do justice to her. It was such an honor to be chosen to portray her but also to hear the stories of the other women who were portrayed in that play. So, yes, and it happens all the time with underserved populations. Um, there have been plays written about illegal immigrants who step forward and told their stories with a promise of anonymity, or perhaps a minority foreign population in a community that was being mistreated by the majority population. I've seen plays about those kinds of things. You have worked with companies various places and I know one was in New York with I think Ping Chong and I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about that group and that work and your relationship to it. Well I was so fortunate to be able to study with Ping Chong and people in his organization. Ping Chong is wow the work he has done is groundbreaking in terms of nonfiction theater uh, and he uh, works out of a fairly famous theater in New York City. But he also teaches others how to create these kinds of theater presentations in their own cities and towns. Um, and I learned so much from that experience. I, I was a journalist at the time. I was a columnist at the time at the Oregonian. And I like to think that maybe they learned just a tiny bit from me because coming in as a journalist – First of all, I think I startled him. I also think I perhaps inadvertently offended some people, but I, I asked questions like, you're presenting these as true stories. This woman is saying her father had sex with her when she was 11. Can you prove it? Because he could sue your theater company. You know, how do you, how do you establish that these stories are true if you are presenting them as truth and protect yourself legally? 
uh, from the people who are being accused of these horrendous things, the ho- bullying that led to a death. Or, I mean, there was an, if there was no conviction, how do you protect yourself? That's That was my little tiny contribution to it all. But what I learned from them was fast. I learned how to approach these sensitive subjects. Um, to do very long interviews. Now, of course, I'd been doing interviews my entire career, radio, TV, and and then print. But when you sit down to interview somebody for hours and hours and hours, that's a different kind of interviewing. It's breaking down their defense mechanisms in some cases um, to get them to tell you what really happened. And in some cases, these are the most painful memories of their lives. If you are doing a presentation about survivors of rape, if you are doing a presentation about uh, people who, uh, who had been kidnapped, to walk them through that experience, because they want to participate or they wouldn't be speaking to you, but it's so, so hard to let go of the things that they still attach shame or blame to. And so I learned a lot about that. I learned about the pacing. I learned about not just having one person after another stand there and talk um, about how to dramatize it, how to have physicality introduced. It was fascinating. In these somewhat heavy topics, is there a way to integrate humor to make the story more relatable? Yes, there is, and you don't have to try. Because uh, I, I came to believe that part of the coping mechanisms for these wonderful people involved laughing about things, aspects of it themselves. And um, so the humor came from the people I was interviewing. I didn't have to introduce it. It's not jokes. It's just um, seeing irony or um, uh, uh, talking about misunderstandings or there, there always will be ways to incorporate humor. And again, the humor comes from the survivors. As you've looked back over your experiences, people you've interviewed, uh, what places you've been, you know, you're up there on the stage, et cetera. Are there some kind of moments that keep kind of coming back, e- either to haunt you or to inspire you as you as you do the next one? You kind of, you don't let them go, dropping the checkbook, for instance, or whatever. Do they go through your mind? There are so many that you and I could do a solid hour just of the (laughs) bloopers that have happened to me in my theatrical career. And I'll tell you you about one of them if you're interested in just a moment. But um, I will tell you my most immediate reaction to your question was thinking about the show I just finished doing. Eleanor Roosevelt is so widely respected, even decades after her death. She did astonishing things. She was part of the creation of the United Nations and was the first woman delegate to the United Nations. Terry Truman asked her to do that shortly after it was formed by, in part, her husband. Um, Before he died, he met with Churchill and with Stalin, and they kind of established what the United Nations would look like after World War II ended, just before the end of the war they met. But when I did this play... I learned so much about her personal life, the fact that her mother constantly taunted her for being ugly as a child. Her mother died when she was seven, but until then, it was just a a nonstop stream of, you're so ugly, no one will ever want you, Um, you have no charm, why can't you be pretty like your cousin, that kind of thing. And her father was a, a horrendous alcoholic who made a million promises and never kept any of them. And so she built up a fantasy father. He died when she was 10, and she thought he was the only person who ever truly loved her, but the truth is he, he was gone almost all her life. And basically what she got from him was once a year she got a letter for her birthday. So anyway, it was a tragic story. It was a, a difficult and lonely childhood. She was sent off to boarding school at age 10 in England and didn't come back until she was 18 to be a debutante, which she didn't want to be. So... As the story is told in this play, which is called Eleanor, there are funny moments. She had a great sense of humor. There are, um, and there are laugh out loud funny moments, but there are a lot of very difficult moments when her husband got polio, for example, in the 1930s. Uh, She helped him through that when she discovered his many mistresses and was so devastated by that. What I remember is 
when you do a one person show, you are there with your audience, whom I always see as one person sitting there. I don't know why, but you respond to them at the, I, my advice to people is never go to opening weekend of any show <laughs> because actors need time to read the audience and learn from them. So you listen so closely as an actor. Part of that is if they laugh, you don't want to start talking until the laughter starts really dying down so they can hear the next line. But, but that's really a, a primitive example. But for me, listening to hearing people cry hearing first the sniffs <laughs> and then hearing people cry or hearing people laugh or hearing people feel uncomfortable about something. And maybe I'll pull back on that just a little next time. So they still feel the emotion, but they aren't taken out of the, the, the play's experience. I felt such anger at one of the last performances that I did of the show Eleanor, because there was a man in the audience. I later was told it was a man who left his cell phone on, even though there was an, an announcement at the, start of the show, uh, a recorded announcement. He chose to leave his cell phone on and it kept ringing. And he, I guess, because he didn't want people to know it was his phone, he did not answer. So it kept ringing and ringing and ringing. The first time it happened, I was just about to go into a very difficult, painful emotion scene, emotional scene. And, and I had spent a half hour getting this audience right with me. We were so in sync. And suddenly this phone is ringing and audience members are, are turning and looking and they're whispering and talking to, who is that? Why don't they answer? And I've lost them. I've completely lost them. They're sitting in a theater with an audience and they're not in Eleanor's world anymore. I, so I, you have to, I had to handle it. It wasn't, it wasn't ending. And so I asked Eleanor in Eleanor's voice, I said, well, my goodness, what is, what is that? Is that one of those newfangled things that doesn't have a cord? You know, and the audience laughed a little bit, and finally it stopped ringing. And then I, I backtracked just a tiny bit and ad-libbed a few recaps of what had just happened prior to the phone call. And then I went on with the difficult scene. They did not react nearly as strongly as other audiences had because they weren't back with me yet. And then it happened two more times. And I was so angry, but I couldn't show my anger. Because then it would be about me, the actor, and the audience would be pulled out of the story again. So I, I had to keep them with me as Eleanor and not show my personal anger that someone would do that in a theater during a dramatic show. Um, the story I told you that I would tell you, the worst blooper that ever had. Oh, gosh, there are so many. There are so many. But... <laughs> Um, uh, years ago, I did Little Shop of Horrors with Portland Civic Theater. This was in the, the late 80s. I was playing Watry, the cheap, trashy blonde. And um, uh, there's a scene, if anybody's seen the movie or the play, they know what I'm talking about. But there's a giant plant that eats people. It's very hungry. And there's a little shopkeeper named Seymour. And he's in love with Audrey, who also works in the shop the cheap, trashy blonde I played. And at some point, the plant gets me and kind of mangles me, and I'm dying. And Seymour runs in, sees me. I die in his arms. It's a very sweet scene. And then he, I'm dead. What can he do? He feeds me to the plant. Now, I'm wearing, usually I'm in a really trashy getup, but for this scene, I'm in a, a long white nightgown with long sleeves and a high neck, and it, it buttons up the front. But to be Audrey, you have to be va va voom, you know. So, <laughs> and I was really skinny at the time. So, through the miracle of modern engineering, they somehow gave me uh, a very large chestal region and uh, an amazing, remarkable bra. There probably was a lot of metal in it or something. But <laughs> and and I was wearing bikini underpants, and this is what I was wearing underneath the nightgown. Okay, so. Uh, Seymour puts me in the plant and the plant closes. There's a guy inside the plant. It's a giant plant that makes the plant move when it talks. Okay. And also opens wide when people are fed to it. So typically I would turn around inside the plant, kind of ball up. And then I would, I'm on my back and I would stick my hands between the legs of the guy inside the plant through a hole at the back of the plant, which abuts a piece of scenery and there, we had a high school intern whose job it was to crawl out, because there's a window back there, so we had to crawl and not be seen, to crawl out, reach the hole, 
grab my hands and pull me out of the plant. And he, he did this every night, and he'd pull me out in my white nightgown. But this night, my nightgown got stuck inside the plant, and I couldn't move. And the guy inside the plant is like, get out, get out. I have to start talking. You can't be sitting in there and I talk. You have to be di- digested. So I unbuttoned my nightgown oh, no. and turned around <laughs> and put my hand through the hole. <laughs> at the back of the plant and the high school kid pulls me out and here I am va va boom in, in this oh. bra and bikini pennies and he just goes you you probably have to bleep this but he goes holy shit <laughs> <laughs> and then we had this intense whispered argument because usually I crawled out ahead of me and I was not going to allow that so I made him crawl in front of me <laughs> as we crawled oh. off stage um, and we had to crawl or we'd be seen through the window. So that mm. was a pretty, that was a pretty, and then, by the way, when the plant started talking, the white nightgown was waving around inside the plant. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, so, yep, yeah, there and go. there have been so many. One time we were doing Guys and Dolls and the entire set fell forward onto everyone sitting in the in the nightclub watching the, the girls do their number. It, it, I mean, you just can't imagine. There have been so many funny things. Mm, and you just have to keep going. You do. <laughs> you do. One time I was in the musical Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, which is a series of little tiny scenes and songs. And uh, the guy who played Snoopy opened a scene sitting on top of his doghouse. It was maybe 10 minutes into the show, and he started the scene that ended the play, and we ended the play. What else could we do? Right. Oh, dear. <laughs> what are the projects compelling you right now, Margie? What's kind of on your list of, of either writing or acting or singing or thinking? What, what's, what's top of mind today? I'm in, the, I'm in the middle of writing three plays, three new plays. One is a musical that I started in the 80s about my first year on hosting AM Northwest in 1977. When I was, uh, you know, fairly experienced, but not really experienced hosting live TV, and Jim Bosley was my co-host, and he he wanted to host the show alone. He didn't want me to be hired. So the the musical is about how bad I was and him doing everything in his power to get rid of me (laughs) and all the crazy things that happened at the station on live TV, uh, especially doing telethons, you know, where so many things go wrong in my musical that when we go for a new total, it's lower because people are calling in and withdrawing their pledges. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm writing that as a musical uh, with the encouragement of my friend Don Horn, who uh, founded and runs Triangle Theater in Portland. And he's the one who wrote the musical about Darcel and many other plays. So he is encouraging me to do that. I'm doing two other shows. And I'm also going to be, um, and I've never done this before, but about five years ago, uh, I did a one-woman show about Ann Richards, that spitfire governor of Texas with the white hair. Do you remember her? Absolutely. She was amazing. Very, yes, very much yes. so. Yes, well, um, I did this play five years ago, and we extended and extended and extended. People really enjoyed her. And so we're bringing it back since it's an election year. And uh, I, I picked up the script the other day. I had kept my script, thank goodness. And I looked at, I don't remember a single line. And I thought, oh, no, I have to do this all over again. (laughs) By the way, to learn Eleanor, um, which was a two-hour, 15-minute, one-person play, it took me three and a half weeks to memorize that. I I hope I can do it again in the fall. I guess, you know what, maybe it's good. Maybe it's preventing dementia. Who knows? (laughs) They say but it absolutely, is hard. absolutely. They say that it used to be much more common for schooling, for instance, to memorize uh, poetry and other readings. And I think it's they say it's really good for you as, as an older person to go back into that habit. So you're you're ahead of the game, Margie. <laughs> Have you done theater? Uh, very little, very little really? in, in high school. I am a singer, but I sing in some groups. I don't tend to do theater. Um, uh-huh. I like radio. Radio is a little bit a little bit anonymous, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, I lost that when I went to TV. The mm-hmm. fit, the difference between the mediums I was in is, um, what, now this, I was in radio in the 70s, in the mid-70s, and this was before Ronald Reagan got rid of all the fairness doctrine and the equal time requirements. And so w- it was very important to, unless it was an opinion show, it was important to not, to not express your personal opinion and to get representatives of people who felt differently. Um, and so 
that was interesting. But um, my voice was sometimes recognized, but rarely, because I, I didn't do that much. But I was never physically recognized, of course, when I was on radio. When I moved to TV, all that changed. I mean, it was so amazing. Um, this was before cable, and there were only four stations in Portland, and about half the people were watching our show in the mornings. I remember one time, I guess I mentioned on the air that my husband didn't like asparagus. And I was standing at the grocery store in front of the produce section, and a woman goes, now remember, he doesn't like asparagus. And I went, well, who doesn't? And she, he, she said, your husband. I said, do you know my husband? She said, no. No, I don't know you. Oh, dear. So that was that was a different kind of experience. But on TV, they wanted everyone to like you. The managers bugged me incessantly about dyeing my hair blonde. And I, I, I'm not a blonde. I don't look good as a blonde. And and so, but they just thought people would like me more if I was a blonde, you know. But then when I joined the Oregonian, I was a columnist. And immediately they told me, what is your opinion on this? You can't just write about it. You have to tell us what you think. We're paying you to express your opinion. That was hard. And get I had hate mail on TV for my looks, and my hair was ugly or whatever. Um, but I got I really got a lot of hate mail when I was at the Oregonian for my opinions. I want to close with just one more comment, if you will, if people already don't know enough about you and will learn much more and find more. There are people who may not know your connection to the Sylvia Beach uh, Hotel. And I'd oh, love for you, you about that. I'd love for you to just, you know, talk just for a minute. Which is your room and maybe what the hotel is and, and we'll we'll close on that on that note. Oh, thank you for asking me. The Sylvia Beach Hotel is owned by um, some friends of mine. Uh, Goody Cable is one of my very dearest friends. She got the idea of well, actually, she saw an old kind of rickety hotel overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Newport, Oregon. And this was in about 1985. And she, um, she, she thought it should be a hotel for book lovers and have each room decorated in the style of a different author, have a restaurant and, you know, upstairs, a library with a fireplace and Every night they would serve spiced wine, that kind of thing. And so um, she had trouble getting a loan. She was a woman. And they told her outright, you know, we don't loan to give loans this big to, to women. And she was frustrated and angry about that. She made it her goal that she would make this hotel happen. And someday there's a center column on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that's usually a feature story. And she knew all bankers read the Wall Street Journal. Her goal was to be the subject of that front page story in the Wall Street Journal so they'd realize what a mistake they made. And she did it. But anyway, um, she couldn't really get a loan. So her, her best friend that she'd grown up with had some money to invest and they fixed up the hotel, but they could not afford to decorate the rooms. So they asked people they knew each to decorate the room in a style of their favorite, one of their favorite authors. Now, I came on late after someone had dropped out, and I said, um, oh, I, I want to do something French. And they said, well, we already have someone doing Colette. And I went, eh. So then I thought it would be fun to do a mystery room. Now, the truth is, I didn't reveal this at the time, I had never read an Agatha Christie book. <laughs> but I loved the idea of, you know, decorating it like an English country home and having chintz and dark colored walls, which was rare in this country then. And so I said, I'm going to do Agatha Christie. And then I made my infamous announcement. I'm going to have one clue in the room from every book she ever wrote. Whoa. Then I found out she'd written 83 oh, books. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank goodness, I, there was a bookstore in town then called Murder by the Book. And the woman not only donated a complete set of books for the room, because there was a bookshelf in the room, but she told me that Agatha always had the detective recap the whole story in the last chapter. So I read 83 last chapters, and the clues were so odd. You know, uh, one glass eye in a small leather case, uh, a, a 1920s golf club, um, a, a small metal statue of an elephant. So I made a list of all 83, and I distributed them all over town. This was before the Internet. And, you know, everything got donated, even the glass eye. It was astonishing. 
So, um, yeah, the room is filled with clues. I'll, t- I'll end with this story, and that is one of the clues was uh, Agatha had a, a murderer hide behind a floor-length curtain. And so I got a pair of men's wingtips, and I, I, I put them underneath the curtain so the tips were sticking out. But, but when the theater opened, the maids kept turning them in at the front desk thinking that, that guests had accidentally left their shoes. So then I hammered them into the floor, and some of the maids pried them up and turned them in at the front desk. Oh, dear. <laughs> you know, there are so many wonderful stories about the hotel, and every author, every great author is represented. People really should go there. A restaurant in the basement is fantastic. It's called the Tables of Content until after the meal, and then it's the Tables of Content. So everybody should go to the Sylvia Beach Hotel. Thank you so much, Margie Boulay, for being on the Oregon Grapevine and sharing these parts of your life. I am grateful for the conversation and for the work you do. Well, thank you for asking me. I'm, I'm flattered and a little nonplussed that you wanted to do this, but it was fun talking to you. And I hope everybody who has heard this will go to the theater. Please support theater. It's so important. You've been listening to KLCC Media's The Oregon Grapevine, fresh pressed conversations with people who are actively and passionately creating the present and future in which they wish to live.